Okay, this, here is Abraham Lincoln, and um, as all of you know, Lincoln is the most iconic figure in American history. Lincoln has a kind of unique hold on our kind of historical imagination. He, Lincoln seems to embody values or experiences that we think are sort of quintessentially American. He's the self-made man, the frontiersman, and of course the liberator of the slaves. Many thousands of books have been written on Lincoln. Nobody knows exactly how to count them all up. Almost any Lincoln you want can be found in the uh, historical literature. The shrewd politician driven by ambition or the moralist for whom emancipation was the sort of logical culmination of a lifetime of hatred of slavery or the racist who actually was not opposed to slavery and did not believe black, there was a place for black Americans in, um, in the United States. Every political tendency from left to right to center, from communist to conservative, from civil rights activist to segregationist has claimed Lincoln as, uh, as an ancestor. And as I say, there are multi-volume biographies of Lincoln, there are one-volume biographies, there are books with titles like um, Lincoln Never Smoked a Cigarette, or things like that. Um, Esquire magazine once ran an article called um, Rules Every Man Should Know, and rule number 115 was, there is nothing that can be marketed that cannot be better marketed by using a picture of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> um, and Lincoln is, in works of art, Lincoln is the sort of, a, if you want a symbol of America, well, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Metropolitan Opera House seeing a wonderful production of Madame Butterfly by Puccini. I hope some of you have seen it or will in the future, but what is the name of the ship on which Benjamin Franklin Pinkerton, the American protagonist, sails into Nagasaki Harbor? It's the Abraham Lincoln. That sort of makes him quintessentially American. In fact, I don't know if Puccini had this in mind, but he's got sort of three quintessential Americans. Lincoln is the ship, the name Benjamin Franklin, another great symbol of America, and the last name Pinkerton, a different side of America, the guy who organized uh, private armies to shoot down strikers in the Gilded Age. Um, I don't know if Puccini was sort of saying something ironic and making his last name Pinkerton, but uh, it's an interesting combination of Americana. And as you all know, Hollywood has gotten into the act lately uh, in the last few years. Uh, many of you might have seen uh, movies like The Conspirator by Robert Redford, or of course, Steven Spielberg's imaginary portrayal of Lincoln, <laughs> or my personal favorite, Abraham Lincoln, The Vampire Hunter, <laughs> which actually I do recommend as an exciting and uh, not all that bad movie. It's, it's not historically accurate, but neither are the other ones, so what difference does that make? <laughs> and Lincoln is linked to all sorts of prominent figures in American history. Here's one of my favorite Lincoln images. <laughs> this is Marilyn Monroe holding up a portrait of Lincoln. She was actually, a, she read a lot of books about Lincoln. She was an admirer of Lincoln. I actually wanted this to be the cover of my book on Lincoln. But the, uh, the publisher would not agree for some reason. Um, and then uh, there are, I, I believe it's true to say that there are only two figures in American history who you can make a living impersonating. One is Elvis Presley and one is Abraham Lincoln. And there are guys who go around and that's their living. They go around opening shopping centers and things dressed as Lincoln. So here's, Here's one of them uh, with me at a conference there, see? <laughs> but it's kind of like, is it not quite tall enough, this one impersonator, but uh, Lincoln was six foot four, he was sort of like our uh, Mayor de Blasio, but um, this is an even better one. It's a letter I got a few years ago from a publisher saying they wanted me to write a blurb, you know, an endorsement for a book called Lincoln on Leadership, written by, um, What's his name? Don Phillips, a oil executive, it says, but also a scholar, a student of the Civil War. And he wrote this book about what we can learn from Lincoln on leadership. And the final paragraph which struck me was this. Like 
like a previous book of his, Leadership Secrets of Attila the Hun. <laughs> this one has the potential to go all the way. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't blurb that. And anyway, um, <laughs> finally, uh, these are a collection of things from, you know, what they call, well, they, do they still publish these things? Supermarket tabloids, you know? Um, I don't read this stuff, but my students pass them along to me. So here's one. I don't know if you can see this. I had Abe Lincoln's baby. <laughs> see that? There she is. It's a, some kind of cloning experiment. The kid looks like, that's the funny thing, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, finally, the best one, this is one that was going to be Abraham Lincoln's corpse revived. <laughs> Miracle drug brings back the dead. He's kept alive for 95 seconds. And the uh, student who passed this along wrote on it, why didn't they have the sense to ask him what his plans were for reconstruction? <laughs> so, so we missed an opportunity there. Um, so. Much of what we know or think we know about Lincoln actually originates with his law partner, William Herndon, who soon after Lincoln died, went around uh, interviewing many, many people who'd known Lincoln as a youth in, in Indiana, really, um, and then wrote a biography which was very much in this, you know, hagiographic or, you know, uh, celebratory mode stressing his humble origins, stressing his moral commitments, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes other aspects of his career d didn't get emphasized. Like, yeah, Lincoln grew up on the frontier. He grew up, as we all know, in very humble circumstances. And yet by the 1850s, Lincoln was a very prominent and successful lawyer, corporation lawyer. They didn't have that many corporations, but he represented the Illinois Central Railroad one of the major corporations of the country at that time. So, uh, you know, he went around the circuit on small cases, but he also was a very successful lawyer, not just a backwoodsman. Um, on slavery also, Herndon spread this story, or used this story, you know, Lincoln as a young man, I mentioned this, twice went on a flat, uh, took goods down to New Orleans, down the Mississippi River on a flat boat, and on one of these, he spent some time in New Orleans. The problem is, he never said anything about this. But Herndon sort of developed the idea, this is where he really developed a hatred of slavery. Now, it's true, you couldn't spend a lot of time in New Orleans without encountering slavery at that time. It must have had an effect on Lincoln. We do not know what it was, but Herndon sort of elaborated to make him a kind of emancipationist from the very beginning, from age uh, 21. Um, but it is also true that in the 1840s, I, I mentioned this in the, my book, which is on the reading list this week, Lincoln, as a lawyer, defended a man in Illinois, or was the attorney for a man in Illinois, who was trying to get back possession of slaves, a woman and her children, who, had, who he had brought into Illinois in violation of state law, and they had been abolitionists had told him they were free, and he went to court to get them back, and Lincoln represented him. He lost, but so his... It's a little too simple to just make him a lifelong um, moral opponent of slavery. There are other Lincolns out there. David Donald, the great historian from Harvard, in one, maybe the best one-volume biography back in the 90s, uh, portrayed Lincoln as a follower, not a leader, a man who was kind of buffeted around by circumstances and um, really was just pushed by events in one way or another. Or there's um, Richard Hofstadter, my, my mentor in a great essay on Lincoln in the American political tradition, took as, a, as his ep epigram for Lincoln a quote from Herndon, his ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. He was an ambitious politician. He would do or say whatever was necessary to get ahead. And as we'll talk about in a minute, Hofstadter juxtaposed two speeches of Lincoln in 1858, one in northern Illinois, anti-slavery, talking in moral terms about racial equality for black and white, and then in southern Illinois, talking against black suffrage and black um, uh, other political rights. So what this, what, what Hofstadter said, well, this just proves, he'll, like any politician, he says what he thinks the audience uh, wants to hear. Uh, even more extreme, there was Lerone Bennett, a black scholar who about 10 so years ago published a book, Forced into Glory, in which he said, no, Lincoln's just a racist. 
That's it. Lincoln is a racist. There's nothing more to be said. And uh, forget about uh, his, you know, uh, exalting him in any way. Um, and then there's me who came along and emphasized what I argued as Lincoln's growth or change over time and coming closer to radical Republican positions as the Civil War uh, uh, went along, open-mindedness, capacity for growth being one of his great qualities. But none of these actually explain very well what we want to talk about today, which is Lincoln before the Civil War. How does Lincoln get to the position he occupies? How does he get the Republican nomination? How does he get elected? What does he stand for and believe in then, rather than looking at everything backwards through the you know, lens of the Emancipation Proclamation? 